we had one portfolio in particular and it was all theory and they admitted they got it out from chat GPT as well. It's really important that teams work off the scorecard because that's all we can mark on in verbals as well. We're looking for mutually beneficial relationships or mm -hmm. mutually beneficial sponsorships and partnerships. That's something a lot of teams missed within an enterprise. We as the judges, we know what a budget is. We know what project management is and why you should use it. We're interested in how did you use it and how did they use what they learned and actually implement it. I wouldn't be worried about, you know, what your word to thing ratio is. You should be worried about doing more work to a degree. This could be the, the difference between this team coming first and second. And like, are we absolutely confident we've made the right call on this? But we don't have a lot of time, which is why it's important to signpost everything. Hello and welcome to Off The Track. My name is Peter and today I am joined by Holly. Hello. Circa. Hi. Kim. Hello. James. Hello. And David. Hi everyone. And we were all judges at the 2023 F1 and Skills World Finals in Singapore. So hopefully you uh, recognize us from that if you were there. But the idea of today's episode is just to give some general feedback we found from judging our respective areas. Got a judge here from every area um, that was judged. So for each panel, we're going to go around and basically kind of go through what were the common mistakes that generally most teams made. And I think David will start off with you. You've got a few notes. So what were the common mistakes for enterprise? Yeah, certainly so for enterprise, a lot of the teams, what we're looking for, we want to see for all the different areas that you've got a clear strategy, that you've got a plan to implement that strategy, and then we want to see evidence you've actually implemented it. So that's probably the, the key things that a lot of teams had made across all the different criteria. They hadn't got that clear strategy, hadn't got the plan to implement it, and or they hadn't got evidence that they implemented it either. Some of the top teams did, and that's why they did well. So it's basically, I remember now from when I was judging, it's all coming back to me now. So it's kind of, you know, it's good to explain how you did it, but we want to see, okay, over time, did you improve... And, you know, it's not just about listing your strategy, but actually how did you implement it? Is that yeah, fair to yeah. say? I mean, so social media is a great example. You know, we want to see what your social media strategy was, what your plan for your social media was, when you plan to do your post, and then what the actual results were. Because we had some teams who had amazing results, like they had, you know, 300,000 views, some had over a million views. But where was the strategy? Where was the, um, the plan to implement that? And we had other teams that had, you know, fantastic strategy, fantastic plan and then you look at their social media numbers and they like have you know 60 followers you're like maybe that hasn't worked well i think as well what, what i really liked and what we were looking for a lot is what where did you start and where did you finish like just a comparison so some of the teams were starting from scratch and some of the teams were starting after their nationals they're like social media strategy um which either was fine really we just wanted to see that you knew how to implement a strategy and how it worked so um yeah, sort of showing us where you started and where you finished and maybe showing us like an like a percent increase or something shows us it shows us that you've really understood well what a what the point of your strategy was, which was probably getting more exposure, uh, usually. Um but yeah, I think the before and after some of the winning teams did that and I mean I remember getting loudly excited <laughs> in the judging room when we saw <laughs> our only team in the stream that did it. <laughs> um but yeah, that was was pretty exciting. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing that we, especially with sponsorship, a lot of teams struggled with the ROI question. Hey. And there was, there was two things with that. One of the teams in particular had their ROI for the sponsors hidden in their document and it wasn't easy to find. And I remember when we were doing the calibration, I think that was the only one Peter and I disagreed on. Um, and then we recap, we went through it and we looked at it and actually that's, we, we actually both had ended up agreeing completely on the score when we'd actually found the, um, a bit on ROI, but having demonstrating, you know, what you've done for your sponsors beyond putting their name on the t-shirt and on the car and on the pit display is really where a lot of teams fell down. They didn't actually show what they'd done for their sponsors above and beyond that. And you know, the teams that did really well had got some good demonstration of that. The um, one of the questions as well that I liked asking for all of the sponsorship um, was just. What are you giving to your sponsor? Why do you think they're sponsoring you? Like, if, if you're if you're in the company, why, if you receive this email, would you open it and actually interact with you? It's most likely n not only because of exposure, 
And very often, actually, you'll find that some sponsor- sponsoring companies don't actually care that much about the logo. Some do very much, don't get me wrong. But sometimes it's more about, well, you're going to be using their software and then you're going to go out into industry and you're going to know how to use the software, which means that when you start getting a job, you'll be like, hey, can I use this software? Because that's how I know that's, I know how to use it. And then your boss is going to be like, yeah, all right, okay, we'll buy it for you. And this time you're not getting the free sponsorship one, you're paying. So your future customers as well, your future clients, um, which not a lot of the team discerned with a lot of the software sponsors. Um, some got there and definitely uh, also uh, in the winning ones. But also a small note um, on what David was saying about the ROI being hidden in the portfolio. But I think that's going to be probably across maybe all panels and do correct me if I'm wrong, but um, am I correct in saying that they get the rubric before the competition, right? Yeah. Look at it and try to assess your portfolio against the rubric. Can we easily find what we need to find to give you points? If it's a sustainability, it says it talks about the triple bottom line. So the um, economical, environmental and social benefits. It really helps if you're categorizing your sustainable initiatives in those categories because then it's easy for us to see that you've understood and we can just, you know, skip on rather than what David and Peter did for a bit, which was sit down for like five minutes and just sort of be like, but where are the ROIs? We can't find them. And then David was like, no, no, look, they're there in very small. And we're like, oh, okay, <laughs> our bad. We found them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just read the rubric and make it easy for us because... We all have a lot of teams to assess and we want to give you the points. We just need to find the information. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing that the teams have really got to bear in mind when they're looking at the rubric is look really carefully, especially for um, when it says judging criteria, because a lot of teams when we're judging enterprise, we can only judge off what's in the enterprise portfolio. And we, what we then do with the interviews, we just clarify some of that. But a lot of teams, you know, we, we, when we talk to them about um, you know, where's your plan? Oh, that's in a project management portfolio. Well, as enterprise judges, we don't look at that. So there's a lot of teams have done some great planning and some great stuff, but you need to show some of those elements in your, in your enterprise portfolio as well. Because unfortunately, we have to use the rubric very literally. And if it says you can only mark off the enterprise portfolio, we can only mark off the enterprise portfolio. So if you've got great stuff about enterprise in one of your other portfolios, then unfortunately, we can't take that into account. No, I was just going to say, we had that a lot in project management as well, where especially in terms of the budgeting and the monitoring where they might mention, oh, we have a lot more detail in the enterprise, but again, we can't see that. And the other thing kind of to echo off what Kim was saying around the rubric and around understanding how marks are assigned, I think that's really important. A lot of teams would miss key areas or they're not looking at how the scores are weighted. So if there's two areas being judged in one under one heading and one is 20 marks, the other is 10 marks, don't just include one paragraph on the 20 marker because that's worth more of the weight of it. Do you know? Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, we, we say it a lot on the podcast, but it's just reading the school cards. They're there. That's what we're judging against. Um, so don't write about, you know, you might write about something else that sounds brilliant, but if it's not on the school cards, it's not in the criteria, then we can't give you marks for it. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. And, um, and as David and Kim were saying, you know, try and make it easy for the judges to find the information. If you're burying it so deep that, you know, we've got to really put a lot of brain power into it, well, it's less likely that we're going to give you the marks for it um, because we don't have that long to read, you know, each portfolio. We'd love to read each portfolio for about an hour, but we don't have that kind of time because, you know, this year there were 17 teams in each stream. And if we read each one for an hour, well, we'd be here for, you know, two days pretty much trying to read. Um, do the teams know what timeline we work on? Do, I don't do, think do so. Do they have an idea? No, I don't think so, can, no. Can we tell them? So, no. Well, the, you know, this is probably the uh, only kind of insight they get into our kind of process. So, if you understand that, you know, we don't have a lot of time to read, then kind of just, yeah, just make it easy for us. Write concisely, write clearly, um, and just make it easy for us. That's the main the main thing. Holly, well, there with verbals. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. (laughs) I was going to say what a lot of teams did well was sometimes just using the titles from the scorecard to split Mm. up their portfolio. And it made it very easy to go through and go, yeah, okay, they have every section. And you knew that the content you were looking for had to be on that page. 
So that was something really good that not all teams did, but the teams that did do it, it made the marking a lot easier. That's it. Yeah, hundred percent agree with that. Um, and Holly, with verbals, you know, there are no portfolios for you to go off of, so it's just that, no. <clears throat> um, just that presentation. So, we, did you find that there were any kind of common things where you know teams were making mistakes? Yeah. So for verbals, um, you if you look at the scorecard again, referring back to the scorecard, it's really important that teams work off the scorecard because that's all we can mark on in verbals as well. So it's split up into innovation, collaboration and learning experiences. And they're the only three areas we can mark on. So if you're not clearly signposting to us, you know, this is our innovation. This is our collaboration. This is our learning experience. We can't do anything with it. And we can only work off the 10 minutes that they have for the verbals. The question and answers after we can't mark on if it's not in that 10 minutes, then we can't. We ask questions if we're if we find something particularly interesting or if we think oh they've run out of time we're going to try and let them elaborate on this particular innovation or something like that um but it's really you know it's that 10 minutes and 10 minutes is all you've got and it's not a very long time but it's enough for them to be able to sort of clearly clarify any points but again um it's a, a way that teams could structure it is by having sort of the innovation heading and again clearly signposting to us that that's what they're talking about so yeah it's just that common theme of just making it make just make it easy for us to judge mm -hmm. you you know don't don't try and bury it and make no. it complicated no we don't want to be picking apart the um presentations because this year we were actually recording each presentation as we went so we'd have something to refer back to but again, we don't have the time to look back through sort of 68 uh, presentations. Um, you know, that's just not a feasible thing to do. Um, but it's, you know, it's useful to look back on if we say, oh, I'm not sure if they explained that particularly well, because um, we're going off what we heard in the moment. And that's also why we have a panel of judges, because I remember I would say, oh, I don't think they talked about this at all. So say, I don't think they talked about any kind of enterprise innovation or anything like that. Um, but then another judge would go, no, no, they did. They did. And then it was nice to have that panel because as one person, you can miss something. Um, so it is useful to have. Uh, there was three judges in my stream, but there was always at least two in for a verbal sitting and listening. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's a good point, Ollie. I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, because Peter and I were in separate streams and we were making sure, because Pam was leading the stream. She did an absolutely fantastic job of leading it. She was brilliant. I'm so glad she was our um, enterprise lead. Um, but yeah, just that across the different streams, making sure we're marking consistently. Mm -hmm. I think there was only, there's only that one incident where we were off, wasn't there, Peter? That yeah. otherwise we were kind of pretty much 100% aligned. And then mm -hmm. we realised because there was a bit that was missed, but the rest of it were aligned. But a lot of the time we're going through the portfolios and going, is this, you know, marking them? And then it's that, as you say, Holly, making sure with the other judges are all marking consistently and we've mm -hmm. agreed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, each stream there's two to three people marking each of the portfolios. And then we then compare those. We do some cross-marking with the other streams. And that's what makes sure that we get that consistency across the different yeah. bands. How yeah, was it for... How did you do that for verbals? So, as I said, we recorded each team. And at the end of the two days of judging, we each went in with our top two teams and what their scores were that we had for them. Um, and we watched the top, uh, the top uh, team from each stream, but also an extra team that had a really high score. And we all basically voted on who we thought was the best it is slightly different watching it back on a recording um i remember the team that was top in my stream i really fought for because it the passion that they had didn't quite come across in the recording but when you were in the moment sort of having the eye contact the engagement is a little bit different in the recording but obviously that's why I was there to sort of fight for them and go, no, no, these were really good. It doesn't quite come across, but they were really good. Um, and yeah, I think it was uh, really useful because we had our lead judge, Audrey, was going around. Each, she'd like earmark teams 
to go and watch so she would sit in and then help us in the judging process and basically talk about how we felt about their presentation and then yeah so we went through the top sort of five scores and sort of there was one team that was marking slightly harsher so we brought them up one uh, stream that was marking slightly like generously so we brought them down and it was all that kind of moderation that made it really useful but it was really interesting to see um the judges perspective across the board and what they felt defined a collaboration because this this is one big thing that teams did with collaboration we all agreed it's about a give and take it's not just a one-way street and some teams really missed that. It was just about what their sponsors or partners gave to them and not what they gave back. But the whole point of the competition is what you can give them because, you know, you might learn a lot from a company who's manufacturing your wheels, but also what are they learning from you? Because this competition is so interesting. You know, of course they're going to learn something from you and we want to hear about that. That's the whole point of collaboration. I've, I've got to ask though, Helena, that's a really good point, I mean, that, that's, that's key, but I've got to ask, the team you were fighting for, was that the same team that wouldn't let you wouldn't let you recline your seat on the plane on the way over? <laughs> no, it actually <laughs> was not. Um, that is one really good point though, so um, as judges, we start judging you from the very beginning, you know, um, I had a lot of teams on my flight and... Um, and some teams are very easily recognisable travelling their uniforms. And think about representing yourself, you know, let the judges recline their seats on the planes. They want to sleep. <laughs> Come on, they have a long few days ahead of them. Oh, <laughs> and they get voluntarily and paid for the flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, that was good. Um, you, did, you did bring up a good point there, Holly, that we also found within an enterprise, which was... And it explicitly says in the criteria for Enterprise that we're looking for mutually beneficial relationships or mm -hmm. mutually beneficial sponsorships and partnerships. Um, and that's, that's something a lot of teams missed within an Enterprise, mm -hmm. um, certainly that we found um, when I was judging with Kim. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of teams are talking about, okay, yes, we got money and, you know, they manufactured our wheels for us and that kind of thing. But we wanted to see where was the mutual benefit? What were they getting out of it? Um, as mm -hmm. well and that was what separated the top teams up when we were doing the moderation absolutely um that's what we found Did, would you agree david and kim kim yeah yeah absolutely i mean it's what i mentioned earlier it's it's sort of also understanding that like there's somebody in an office that made the decision and there's probably a reason for it and usually it's not just exposure because if you're just offering exposure it, it usually mm -hmm. doesn't work think of who you are you are students, um, you are potentially a gender diverse team just recently. Um, I explained that to the teams that we were judging for a bit of context, but I'm on my university's formula student team in charge of all the sponsorship. Um, and just yesterday, um, we've reached an agreement with one of our new sponsors. Um, and part of the sponsorship deal is that we only get money if we increase our gender diversity numbers. Um, and that's because they want to put their name behind, you know, the women in STEM and stuff like that. So it's mm -hmm. it's sort of thinking about that. And and maybe if you are an all women's team, that's maybe that's part of the reason why they're sponsoring you because they want to put their names behind supporting that and just sort of understanding that. Um, and again, the meaning in industry that you're going to be out knowing how to use their product and everything, just all these things. Just And it's as simple as asking them, why are you sponsoring us? They will very gladly answer. I've done it before. And I've done mm -hmm. it as well, where I give them my sponsorship prospectus and I'm like, what would you rather see in this because this didn't convince you or, you know, tell me. And like, they'll answer. They want mm -hmm. to because they want to help yeah. you. And obviously they want to be on the name. They want to be on the brand. Like, sorry, they want to be on the car of the team that won. So they, if that helps you win, they're going to tell you. <laughs> and yeah. so going across to the car now, uh, James, you know, there are a lot of big regulation changes this year. Were there, were there any sort of common mistakes you found? from your sort of judging area? I think, I don't know, I, I couldn't probably pinpoint any particular mistakes in what people did. I think probably the biggest thing that we saw from the portfolios to the interviews was just teams not documenting stuff they did. So I think there was probably two particular teams that, um, and, and it's a key thing with the foreign schools. Like, I mean, obviously different schools and different regions have different access to different things, but 
not everyone can make their own cars and things at their own school. So a lot of people outsource that, but um, sometimes there's a, a, a lack of understanding demonstrated of the entire process that goes on invo- and is involved. And I guess to a degree, it can be unfair to the teams that don't have access to things to manufacture themselves. Um, but I guess they can also kind of involve themselves as much in that process. But teams that typically outsource, there was a lot of teams that didn't show the full understanding or breadth of understanding of how to manufacture everything that some people did. Um, and then for other teams that did do it themselves, um, a lot of the teams that haven't been in the competition for a while, so maybe aren't so familiar with the portfolio, but you know, they went out of their way, you know, made a non-Denford machine, manufactured their cars, they did all the lathing of their wheels and everything. And to them, that's just menial. It was like they had to do that to get to that final point. But um, it wasn't documented at all in the portfolio other than, you know, we made the wheels and we made the car. Um, so it's like, you know, if you could demonstrate all of that understanding that you did and all the reasons you, you know, chose to have this milling process over this, you know, that's really what we're looking to see. Yeah. And I think that's probably common across all the areas is just, you know, documenting what you've actually done. And I feel like for enterprise, we, we care more about what you have done rather than what it is you're talking about, if that makes sense, more about, you know, would, would you say so? Soccer, it's it's kind of the same for project management that you want to see more evidence rather than more of an explanation definitely. about the process. Yeah, no, definitely. Like you might have a lot of teams that might spend a lot of time explaining to you what a budget is or what scope creep is, and they're wasting real estate in their page by mm. having half the page nearly. And it, it's textbook quality information. Like the information is great and it's really in depth, but. We as the judges, we know what a budget is. We know what project management is and why you should use it. We're interested in how did you use it? Like, did you implement some concepts of it? Did you kind of, did you do any research beforehand? Like, what was the impact of you guys having a budget? Not just, oh, this is a budget and this is why it's used in the general working world. And then they might just insert kind of a table of their budget, but we want to understand what was their approach to budgeting and how did they use what they learned and actually implement it. Yeah, yeah we, we, had had a, we had a really sim- sorry. No, no yeah, um, yeah, yeah we ahead. had a really similar thing in engineering, and I, I mean, it's, it'd be interesting to see how it varies throughout countries. Um, but like, I think there was a general consensus between all the engineering judges of like, you know, if you're going to the world finals and you're producing all this engineering, you kind of have to. I think you should under- expect that the engineer, the engineering judges are going to be engineers or people from that industry, and that you have to kind of expect some baseline level of understanding in that field and I heard from a, a few German teams that maybe they're told at their national finals that they have to treat everyone you know as if you're teaching a child kind of thing but you know I think in terms of using your portfolio and linking it properly like there's a lot of teams that you know explaining what drag is or explaining like a concept it's like I don't really need to read a textbook about what this is like I want you to I think maybe they get stuck between the step of like explaining what drag is but they're, you know, explaining the definition of that as opposed to later on in the book that like in, in the development of their car, they're talking about, oh, well, drag was really important. So we like to our car design. So we were focusing on minimizing it or we did this experiment because we thought it was important to reduce drag. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, as you said, kind of um, not really writing a textbook for people and so much as explaining how those concepts were useful for you. And I think Would it, comes it be a back fair to- assumption... Sorry. Sorry, no, okay. you go. But would, it, would it be a fair assumption to say that if it's in the rubric as a term as is, the judges probably know what it is and you don't need to explain it? Should we just work off of that? I think, yeah. like, if 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 you see, you know, all these things, um, I mean, I was looking at the enterprise rubric earlier, but, like, we had a few people explaining to us what a strategy was. Actually, I don't actually remember, Peter, but in, in some of our portfolios we did, and it was like, we, well, we know, but what was yours? <laughs> and And did it work? <laughs> That was, I'm pretty sure every single interview was like, so did it work? What was the outcome? Um, instead of, yeah, half a page on what a strategy is. So, yeah, I think if it's in the rubric, assume the judges know what it is. And the way you demonstrate your understanding is if you're actually applying it. I mean, we had a, as you say, we had one portfolio in particular and it was all theory. It was like, and they admitted they got it out from chat GPT as well. <laughs> um, in their interview. And, you know, it was like, <laughs> apply it. You know, mm-hmm. don't don't tell like for project managers. Don't tell us what a risk matrix is. Show us your risk matrix. Show us your um, social media strategy. Don't tell us what a social media strategy is. Show us it, and that'll show us that you understand it, and that'll get you the marks. 
But theory is, as I think we've all agreed, is, is not what we want. We just want application. We want the strategy and the application. And I think it comes back to, you know, as I said earlier, just being concise. Like we, 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 we probably, yeah, as, um, as I said before, you know, the people judging you at the world finals, they're probably industry experts or former competitors. They know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I was saying, you know, we, we don't have an hour to read per portfolio, even though we'd like that. So you've just got to try and be concise. I think probably ditch the theory, or if you really do have to include, you know, the theory, put one line or two lines, at least for the sort of enterprise kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, the judges probably already know it. Um, yeah. I think you're so, writing for the judges. You're not writing for your sponsors. You're not writing for your teachers. You're not writing for your parents. You're writing for the judges. And you might get your teachers or parents going, I don't understand what drag is. I don't say, well, you need to say, well, that, that's, that's not my problem. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, writing for the audience, that's the main thing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think that's one thing with verbals is obviously we're not reading anything they've written. Um, but one thing um, I like to see is if teams brought in project elements, especially their car, because it made it easier if they were explaining sort of any engineering concepts, any engineering innovations, if we can actually see it rather than just hearing about it as a concept obviously it's different in a portfolio you can include photos and stuff for clarification but for verbals what what you give is what we see basically we want to see the car especially for me i'm not coming from a particularly strong engineering background so having something physical there to help your explanation just really helps um with another line in the scorecard which is concept clarification you know Definitely. Um, so we, we got a few questions in from uh, our audience, um, mainly those who are actually competing this year. And one of the questions was, did the standard of the competition improve this year? So probably one for the judges who judged last year as well or in the past. Um, did you find that the standard improved this year? I think at the, at the very top, it was in some areas a, a marginal improvement. It wasn't a big leap like we've seen in previous years I think because we've been doing virtual events I think also because you know with the portfolio sharing that's happened with Hydron and the other teams that's kind of set a good benchmark which has been good so I think that's raised a lot of other teams up that wouldn't perhaps be at that level but I don't think there's been the the jumps that we've seen in previous years I think the um, certainly the, the sponsorship and marketing isn't as as big a jump I think probably Digital's gone very well and sustainability's definitely been a jump in that. There's been a lot of improvement in that area. Yeah, I, th- I think for verbals, um, again, it's the standard is very good every year and it's hard to define if the standards had a big jump in sort of quality. You know, the quality is very good anyway. We're more looking for sort of standout teams of like, oh, they've done something a bit different. Um, it's not so much the, the standards higher, it's the standards always high, you know. And then for the, from the engineering side of things, James, did you find that there was any kind of jump in the standard or was it pretty much the same? I, I reckon, I mean, I, in terms of world fires, I've judged last year in 2022 and this year. And I, I think, I think from... I mean, obviously, you get different streams, but I think probably on average, the, the standard has gone up a little bit. But um, I think maybe compared to last year, you know, when you have the top teams and the standout teams that went above and beyond, I think um, probably had a few less standout teams. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like the work that those standout teams do, uh, I think at, at our level um, in F1 schools, they all kind of reach the maximum that you can achieve in those areas. But um, yeah, probably just not as many standout teams this year, but you know, across the board still was a really high level and definitely a lot higher th- across the board than when I competed. And another question we got, and we got this last year as well, is about ensuring consistency between the judging streams. And this year, I think we had an extra judging stream just to cope with the, just the sheer number of teams. Um, so the question was, what measures are taking to make sure all teams are judged to the same standard? I don't know who wants to have a crack at that, but. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with engineering. I mean, yeah, obviously it's a really big job for everyone to judge 
what was it, like 67, 68 teams. Um, I think it's hard to remember exactly, but I think from judging from the point of getting all the things to meeting all the judges and then the submission is probably three or four days. I think for engineering, our, our lead judge, um, we, we probably spent that first day just looking over the folios as a group with all the streams. So um, the, the strategy for us was like, as a group, understand um, across a number of random portfolios, like, okay, this is what a 10 looks like for this category. This is what a 15 looks like and get that base level understanding. Um, we did that for like 15 different portfolios across that first day with engineering um, before we broke out into the stream so that you had that um, common understanding of how we were going to kind of scale stuff. Um, and then after we had judged every stream, we came together for about four hours um, at the very end and we effectively had a massive spreadsheet of all of the scores from every single stream, from every single category, and all of the judges went through each category on the scorecard for engineering and we looked at the top 10 or 15 teams and we pulled all their portfolios out we went through like is this team better than this is this team better than this and we raised and lowered some scores in those areas uh, did that for every single category um then still reviewed the top five teams again after that saying you know is it fair the points margin here and there and um yeah but at the end of the day i think um the teams can be like at the end of the day you have the judge the judge each stream and um the teams can feel safe knowing that at the end of the day when we had the final scoring all of the judges from all the streams were in agreement about which team should go where and how many points should be allocated i was um i was really intrigued holly with how verbals would be moderated but i think you've kind of answered that um previously with yeah. so it's mainly the recordings is it and you go back and look at the recordings kind of moderate yeah so we recorded each team um and again this is also to refer back to how much time they used because if we didn't make a note of how much time they used we didn't know if they ran over or ran under um which obviously is another big part of what we're marking on are they at 10 minutes um but it was really useful to look back on um the top sort of teams that we were judging um and it was useful to look at sort of the top two teams from each stream because they're there have been times where you get one stream that has sort of weaker teams and one te uh, one stream that has stronger teams. So how that sort of shapes up with, you know, is is a judging stream marking harsher? Is a judging stream marking more generously? And it's useful to look at saying, well, is that really a twenty? You know, is is that what? Is, is that what we're marking as a 20 or do we need to lower it because another team actually has a 20 and this team was slightly lower um and uh on the very first day of judging we had all the judges in watching the first verbal presentation it was actually in my stream because i was stream a um so we had all i think 11 of us in the judging room watching this team do their um presentation and then we all went through what we'd give marks for and why basically justifying why we thought that and it was really useful because there was a couple of judges who said oh I thought that was actually a lot higher but there were some of us who were like well no they didn't cover this this and this it can't be that high it has to be middle band because it can't be so high um which is definitely very useful because you know, you don't know until you talk about it with your other judges. You know, you could be really generous or you could be just super harsh. <laughs> and to make it fair on the teams, their moderation is really important. And we take it really I think, seriously. I think that's a good point to make about, you know, having the first interview. You know, we all, all of the judges um, in that um, area judge the first team together. Um, which for the team who's getting interviewed can yeah. be a bit Congrats. intimidating having, you know, 11 or 12 <laughs> judges all crowding around for this one interview. Um, but it is it is a good way to kind of set the expectations, as you just explained, Holly, you know. So everyone mm -hmm. kind of goes into their interviews knowing, you know, exactly the same process as all of the other streams um, and what to ask and the questions. Circa, was it kind of the same for you when you did the cross-moderation um, and the it process of project same. management? It was quite similar to what James mentioned in that on the first day, the judges spent several hours, all the judges from four streams spent a few hours in a room together 
and we each kind of did initial stack rankings of our streams. And then each stream would present their kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, top one to two teams and explain why they would give certain scorings. And there was a lot of discussion around, do we agree that this team is better, that this would score higher than this, etc. And I think that was really useful because we had, like, obviously you have a lot of mix of people who have maybe done F1 in schools before, haven't done it. And like Holly mentioned, some judges might have said, oh, I thought that would have been full marks in that particular category. But someone else might then be able to mention, well, actually, they didn't really delve into this area in as much detail as they should have. So there was a lot of stack ranking. Then we would have initially agreed on kind of provisional midpoints and high points, again, to take into the fact that one stream might just by randomness have a lot of the really, really strong teams. And some streams might have a lot of the newer teams. So there was a lot of agreements on, okay, in theory, maybe the max that this stream should be scoring is probably around this range because of the difference across streams. So there's a lot of normalization. And then even throughout the judging process, there's a lot of back and forth to ensure, even at the end, to make sure, okay, are we still happy with our rankings? Are we happy with the scores that we're assigning? And then there's kind of adjustments kind of slightly up or down, depending on how different streams are judging. But yeah, there is a lot of consideration just to make sure that we're being fair to all teams. And I think there, there was a comment you made, David, I remember when we were judging is that, you know, we do recognize that the teams have put in a lot of work um, for their portfolios and all the work they've done. Um, you know, so some teams might have concerns like, oh, you know, maybe they're just kind of, um, you know, willy nilly giving out scores, but it's not the case. Because I remember when oh. we did our cross moderation, that was, that took about, you know, maybe an hour and a half, maybe two hours even. Oh, yeah. It was quite I a mean, lengthy process. We got all the top portfolios out from all the different streams with all different scores. And then we went through and remarked them and then just had for each criteria, is this one better than this one? Is this one, we know we've given this one an 18, this one a 17. Is that right? And I remember we discussed that for, there was some pretty robust discussion to make sure we were, we were spot on with that. And it took yeah. a long time, but we were in the end, you know, Pam led that really well. And we actually came out with a result that we all agreed on. Definitely. Um, so yeah, it was a very, very robust process we went through. Yeah, because um, you know, as you say, these kids have worked on this for <laughs> years. You know, they they put a hundred percent effort into it, and we've got to make sure we're judging it hundred percent fairly, so we can look them in the eye and go, "No, you came second. <laughs> yeah, and it's thoroughly justified. <laughs> and, and it's thoroughly justified. Yeah, and it and it does come down to those. You know, if you do look at the leaderboard, it does come down to those. You know, one or two marks that can make the difference between. Yeah, you know where you place so um and i remember we discussed i remember we discussed that like this could be the, the difference between this team coming first and second and like are we absolutely confident we've made the right call on this yeah yeah um, so um it definitely is quite thorough sorry kim you were going to say something no you're all good i was just gonna like just the side to, side note to what we were saying earlier is that just bear in mind how much time we put in the moderation you've got judges gonna that haven't looked at your portfolio that will need to have a look at it from an outside perspective and that's even less time so just bear that in mind when we get in there we we have a working day so not 24 hours a working day is like eight nine hours uh we walk in we have about an hour an hour and a half of just introduction thank you for being judges this is how everything's going to run then we have x amount of hours different um panels did it differently obviously engineering did all of their first day moderating we did maybe I don't know, I think we did like maybe 30 minutes, 45 of discussion of how we degree and then we were cross-moderating as we went. So Pam would go around our tables and just drop a new portfolio that wasn't in our stream and be like, just start that one for me real quick. <laughs> um, so each one does it differently, which is fine. But so that means that we have now what, how many hours left to look at 17 portfolios? And this is what, make it easy for us. So this is just, I'm just reiterating, but just yeah. realize that we don't have a lot of time and we want to, we've, we've all written those documents that you've written and we want to read them because we wanted people to read them when we wrote them, but we don't have a lot of time, which is why it's important to signpost everything because that way when, you know, stream C is like, no, this is better. It's easier for us to prove it to stream B because, Hey, look, no, it's all there and it's in bold and it's nice and flashy and you know, it's all visible. Um, yeah. Definitely helps. That's a very, very good point. Because we, as you said, we were just going through that comparing, you know, we got six portfolios out, some of which we haven't seen before. Why is this portfolio better than this one? And just trying to just, you know, just really trying to make sure and it make it as easy as possible for us to do that. Yeah, that's it. And I remember Kim and I were judging a portfolio and 
um, we were like, oh, they hadn't done this certain thing. But then we asked them about it and they went, well, it's right here. But we couldn't, we did not see that when we read it initially because it was buried deep. So just again, yeah, try and make it easy for us. Um, there's another question here. If someone asked about what is the perfect data to word ratio in an enterprise portfolio? Because, you know, d- data and having those analytics is very uh, is key to show that your strategy worked. Um, I remember one of the teams that did it quite well, did it very well. Um, yeah, I think Kim, you said before, you know, when they did do it, it was like, wow, yes, you've done it. Um, so, you know, what, what do we think? And I think this goes for other areas as well, is kind of how much data should you have um, and infographics and charts and that kind of thing compared to um, compared to words, maybe circa for project management, because there's a lot of that kind of stuff as well. What would, what would you say? Yeah, I would say it's something that can be tricky for teams to find a balance between. And it depends on whether if there is something that can be explained in your visual, maybe you don't need that extra bit of text to just reiterate what's in the visual. Um, like you would have some teams that, for example, in their Gantt charts, they would just use an entire page and it was that was just the entire Gantt chart. You have other teams who their Gantt chart was so small and maybe blurry that you couldn't really make it out, like you knew it was there, but you couldn't actually identify any of the tasks. So I think I would always nearly, you could get second opinions, you can ask teachers or other people to read your content, but I would always bring it back to the rubric and see like, uh, is is the data that I have and the visualization that I have accompanied with the text does that allow for enough information for the judges to easily put me in the higher band in each of these categories? So I, th- I think it's a balance in some areas. You Like, for example, in the budget, there might be more visualizations and more tables because you're actually showing us the itemized budget, which is grand. But then in other areas, maybe we're looking for more of a, like maybe in the team roles, sometimes there might be too much text there rather than having maybe a diagram that's still conveys the same information, but makes better use of the space that you have available. For engineering, James, you know, you were saying earlier about evidence. How much evidence should you have relative to uh, words? Yeah, I, I, I understand where the question is coming from, but I think maybe for some people that's a misdirected question in terms of what the word ratio to data and everything should be. I think like if you look at the best teams and what they do, I wouldn't be worried about, you know, what your word to thing ratio is. I would say, like, you should be worried about doing more work to a degree because, like, the top teams have done so much work and they have all of that to put in the portfolio. And I think, um, you know, if you start looking at the teams that haven't done as well, um, I, I think the lack of or, or the, the waffling in words comes from the lack of content to fill that space. So I think, you know, I would, as much as I would look at that, I would also consider, like, you know, there's so much more that you could probably do and make sure you're documenting. Like, you know, if you're going through your car design process, you know, you'll have teams that will make two cars and change one thing and then have another one that's their final car. But, you know, you have other ones that will, you know, have tested six different cars with 50 different modifications to every single car. And it's like those teams have graphs and tables full of data to present and everything like that. So, yeah, I would just focus on... Um, doing more work and then I think you will have as much as that's probably not what you want to hear but like the more you can put into the project the more you have to say about it and it will kind of come naturally Mm -hmm. just always think how you can elevate your elevate your project kind of thing Mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think especially for um, in the enterprise you know things like digital I think Kim you made the good point you know we want to see what you did at the start what you did at the end how it impacted so we want to see your data like rather than hearing what a social media strategy is, show us what your strategy is. Show us some examples of what you did. Show us how, you know, when you did this post, how it increased your number of views, how it increased your number of followers. And I think we, me and Peter were asking a lot about adaptation. Did you do something? You realized it didn't really work, so you stopped doing it. Um, did you do something? You realized it did work, so you did more of that. Um, this showing us that is much more interesting. Um, I, as much as I'm an enterprise judge at F1 in schools, I, uh, I'm an engineer, uh, engineering student, um, and I'm very much of the opinion that you, you should only be writing words about data anyway. So, like, I mean, except an introduction and a conclusion, but really the, the words should be talking about the data. So they come hand in hand, which is what James was saying. You, you can't really do one without the other. Um, and when you do too many words and not enough data, we will come around to your pit display and ask you what what was the data um so yeah just definitely put some in um and because the question was specifically for enterprise before and after 
for everything, like not just social media, do it for marketing as well. And then you have a look at how do you quantify marketing? That's not necessarily an easy question. But if you tell us, well, you know, these are the goals. We want exposure to these audiences. And then you're like, okay, well, do you know if you did achieve that? So how many high school students did you reach? How many companies did you reach? Stuff like that. It's And that's when you start talking and that's when you start having those words. But you, you start from the data. So you do need to put that in there. And... Uh- yeah, yeah. I, I am still here. Sorry, even though uh, you can't see me, so maybe there'll be a picture of me here. Uh, but <laughs> um, I think there was a team just on like kind of using visualizations. There was a team that did it quite well. Where I think you know, if you can sort of illustrate your points as an infographic or chart or you know, like a flow chart, that was something we were quite happy to see when that came along. Um, if you can illustrate, mm. you know, using charts rather than words, again, that just helps you be concise. And it helps us understand the point you're trying to make quicker. Um, so I think where possible, if you can do that, then, you know, user charts, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And Holly, you know. I think that's very true for verbals. Um, just what you're saying, you know, if y- you want a presentation to enhance what you're saying, so don't include loads of words. We don't want to be reading as you're talking because it takes us away from what you're talking about. Use images to enhance what you're talking about. Um, you know, if you're talking about your car's wheel design so you've done something really innovative on that don't write about it on the slide because otherwise we're just going to be reading that maybe if you could do i don't know a cool animation there was one team who did this really cool animation with their logo um and that stuck with me because it was something we didn't really see um and we want to see sort of the images to enhance what you're saying and not just gobs and gobs of writing um or and especially not if it sounds like you're reading off the slides because that's not really what a presentation's about we want to um it it doesn't need to be fully scripted um you know as long as you're getting the point across in a concise way it doesn't have to be like word for word exactly what you've rehearsed that can actually be detrimental to your presentation because if you forget one word you're immediately panicking saying oh I've forgotten to say this um but yeah I I think another thing that you know just going back to we're marking off the scorecard um you have three sections in verbals for content which is all we can mark on and they're equally weighted so they should be equally weighted in your presentation as well you know start with your introduction where you introduce yourself then spend i don't know three minutes talking about innovations three minutes talking about collaborations and three minutes talking about your learning experiences don't forget about the learning experiences there were some teams who just completely didn't talk about it and we want to hear the individual sort of um you know the individual learning experiences from each team member it shouldn't be an overarching we've all learned this and it doesn't always have to be positive either. You could say this competition made me realize I really hate engineering and I'm never going to do engineering again. But I actually like the business side of the competition because that's what it was for me. You know, I was a design engineer for my team and I have nothing to do with engineering now. And that the competition helped me learn that. You know, I really love the enterprise side of the competition. Um, it doesn't always have to be it's an engineering competition, so I definitely want to be an engineer. You know, if you make it unique, then you're going to stand out to us. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to ask, um, you know, here for verbals, how do you, um, what kind of stuff do you put on the sort of slideshow and that kind of stuff? But I think you've answered that mm-hmm. pretty well. Um, Okay, and then one of the final questions, what did everyone enjoy the most about the judging experience? Obviously, it's pretty unique for us just as it, as it is for the team. So um, what, what did uh, people find memorable or enjoyable? I think in general, just how impactful it is as a competition is really enjoyable. And it's, it's great to see, well, one of my favorite parts is, especially after the feedback sessions, when teams... You, you can tell when teams are genuinely interested in the feedback that you're giving and they're asking you very specific questions about maybe how they can improve or like we've had teams or afterwards they might say, this area was quite new to us. Would you mind explaining a bit more about like what we could have done better and was this the right approach? And you could tell that they were genuinely interested in the subject area. It wasn't just a case of once you got feedback that they were like, okay, thanks. And they were gone, do you know? 
Um, so mm-hmm. getting to engage with the teams, I think, is is definitely one of my favourite parts. Yeah, I like um, just the whole sort of experience. Being in person is great. You know, you're getting to meet not only um, judges from different um, experiences. You know, you've got industry professionals, you've got people like um, me who've come from doing the competition. And it's interesting to see the different perspectives that they have on the competition and how it relates to sort of the wider world um and then to see teams really taking interest like um in particular areas and ask really the ask the really specific questions on how they can improve and also on what they did well we had a lot of teams sort of say so what did we do well can you tell us what we did well um and being able to give that um sort of feedback and it just it feels like you're making a difference and that was one of my favorite things about the competition yeah i mean i, I just love um dealing with these kids at the, at the level i mean we we spend some time saying telling all the things they have done wrong and things they can improve but the <laughs> standard is unbelievably high mm-hmm. um and i've said this before i mean i i um mentor at one of the universities here on a master's program and I got permission from Hydron, one of the, the winners from last year, to share, show some of their portfolios that they'd done. And these master's students were just blown away at the quality. They're like looking at the project management plan and the marketing plan going, well, these are school kids doing this? I'm like, yes. You know, the, the standard is so high. And, you know, the, these kids, they, they can talk and tell you the difference between, you know, what uh, um, CapEx and OpEx. I mean, I know 40-year-old managers who don't know the difference. <laughs> you know, they are... Uh, I just love working with people at this sort of level. As you say, working with the other judges is great. But also, you know, you get to work with the kids and then hopefully, like yourself, Holly, they come on and then become judges later on. Um, so, yeah, it's just really seeing that progression is one of the things I really enjoy. And also, it's a really good, and as a judge, you know, we, we have to, you probably, a lot of people don't know, but we have to pay our own way. So we have to pay for our flights. We have to pay for our accommodation. Um, so, you know, we, we do it because we love doing it. Um, and we, we, get, we get a lot out. It's a lot of fun. Um, and also, you know, we enjoyed the uh, the Thursday as well. It's always a good day to go to the wander around the garages and see all the mm. kids getting really excited. That was it. That was probably the best one this year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been better than I've been doing since 2018. That's probably the best pit lane walk we've done. Mm. Yeah, I mean, as as David was saying, like, I mean, Kim and I are both from our Formula student team, and for us, it's like going to the competition. It's like, can you come home with us and be on our team? <laughs> like, like the, the level is just is so good. Um, We'd go around the Adelaide teams and tell them that if they ever come to the University of Adelaide, they should very much look us up and join. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, it's it's like it's just really cool to see that level of enthusiasm from everyone, and especially like you know, people from all over the world, like in such different backgrounds, um, you know, seeing the approaches that they took um, differently to each other and the, you know, the struggles and interpretation of different things from different parts of the world was really cool. Um, And yeah, just definitely enthusiasm and to be part of the whole thing and make it, you know, as good of an experience for people now than it was when we did it. Yeah. I I found that, you know, even if, even though it is a lot of work for, you know, for both the teams and also the judges, um, just a really enjoyable experience. Like, you know, you're in another country, you're doing all of this stuff, but I mean, yeah, meeting other people, it's just fantastic. And I think from the judging side of things, you know, going around and giving the feedback, um, there were teams there who were recording our feedback, you know, doing audio recordings and all that sort of stuff. So it's clear they want to improve, which is just fantastic. And it really shows that they're trying to take on your feedback. Um, and better themselves, even if they're not coming back next year, just to, you know, some of the teams were even going to, you know, help their um, their younger teams, you know, coming up um, using the feedback that they got. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a really, really enjoyable event, I think, all around. So mm-hmm. it's just great to be there and great to meet you guys as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it was my first time judging, first time attending F1 in schools as well, uh, because when I was in high school, F1, so I'm French, um, when I was in high school, F1 in schools wasn't really a thing in France. It is now. It was really exciting to see some Frenchies there. But um, first time judging, it was an amazing experience. Uh, I mean, all of you have mentioned already the amazing amount of work. It was very surprising to see. I mean, David, you mentioned that you're showing it to master's students and stuff. I'm in my last year of engineering. Some of the work I've seen is better than things I've seen in honest projects. So that absolutely aligns. Um, But I think, yeah... 
the narrowing it down to two things if there was definitely please all of you watching this when you get to university look up if your university is doing formula student because i'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that and just speak for all formula students team and i might have angry emails afterwards but <laughs> please we want you and please <laughs> apply and please spam us until we let you into the teams um we need people that know everything that you're doing and we need people also I think there's great value in having teams that are that small at F1 in schools because then everyone has to do at least a little bit of something and, well, you'd hope so, and or at least that you're aware of what's happening. And I think on the team, what I've found is that, like, it is jarring how many people have no idea that, well, yeah, sometimes you have to work within a budget and it means you're not allowed to buy the really expensive things because otherwise we can't buy, you know, tires to drive. Um, <laughs> so small things like that. Um, please join Formula Student. It's great and it, it keeps following and then especially if you want to keep working into motorsports and F1 in particular, that's what they want to see on your resume. So if you did F1 in schools because you want to work in F1, do formula student when you get to university. And this applies to not only engineering students, please, especially on our team, we struggle with mostly engineers. We want more. We, we need to work with different degrees. We need to work with people that have different sets of skills to be successful. Um, so that's one thing. And also just the other thing, um, as a woman studying mechanical engineering, um, and who has been around motorsports a little bit now, it's different events, different competitions. It was amazing to see this many women invested in the competition. Um, at least for my part, it was probably the first time that I had seen this many women in a STEM context, in a motorsport context, and it was so exciting. I could not believe it, and I was like, oh my God. It, the world's in a better place, guys. Look at the future <laughs> generation. Um, and I, I was just talking about it yesterday with one of my engineering lecturers. And it's like, there's all these girls and they're all coming and they're all about to get their degrees and, and industry. And it's going to be amazing because look at all of them. So, yeah, I think um, whatever outreach has been happening, it, it's working and it should keep going. And it was amazing to see all of you women doing all of this because it's amazing. And... Unfortunately, there's probably still going to be instances where you're going to be the one woman in the room. But just remember that you did this competition. You know what you're doing. You've done it really well. You didn't get to world finals because you just stumbled into it. So just please, when people will, and I really hope it won't happen, but it probably will, that people will doubt you. Just remember all of this and keep going because it's for initiatives like this that set you apart and then make you very hireable and going to make you succeed, which is amazing. So, yeah. It was amazing. I definitely, <laughs> please let me judge again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Um, was there any other comments that anyone wants to make, you know, generally about the judging process or anything like that before we finish off? No, I just really enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it was really good seeing, um, you know, some was around in Saudi in June and seeing the big leap that some of the Saudi teams had made from mm -hmm. their nationals in June to world so um yeah that that was really good to seeing how much they they improved mm -hmm. i think it's great that you know we're getting more and more countries getting involved at a higher and higher level mm -hmm. so i think that's something we, we're you know because at the moment as you as we said before it's been dominated by a few countries at the top of the leaderboard and it would be mm -hmm. good if it's, we can get a few more countries um in that top top three mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and the thing is Teams are more than welcome to get in contact um, with us as judges. You know, we yeah. are allowed to sort of advise. Obviously, we can't tell you exactly how to do things. It should be coming from you, but you can ask us for advice. That's what we're here for. So, you know, any team that does want to get in contact with me or any of us, I'm sure we'd be more than happy to help. Yeah, I mean, we've all coached, you know, given support to a number of teams. Um mm -hmm. And as part of the judging process, you know, we all declare right at the start, you know, this is a team that I've um, I've been doing calls with and and been giving advice to. I mean, obviously, we help, don't help them with any portfolio thing. We just give them coaching and advice and mm -hmm. talk about a lot of things we actually talked about on this call with them. But, yeah, happy to reach to, for any of the teams that want to reach out. As Holly said, um, we don't charge for it. We'll, we're happy to <laughs> give our time for Well, I don't charge for it. Holly probably charges like a wounded rhino. <laughs> And if you're a team that reclined, you wouldn't let a recliner seat, then you're probably going to have a difficult conversation. But, um, but all joking aside, no, we'd all, we'd all love to help. So if you want to get in contact, please do. Amazing. All right. If there's no other comments, then we will finish off. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to this episode. 
Thank you for having us. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.